Good afternoon. My name is Trisha Edmonds, and it's very much my pleasure to welcome you all to this panel discussion this afternoon. This is another FSC webinar that was developed as part of the COVID-19 um, lockdown and part of the uh, program of webinars that FSC put together. Uh, really, it's a, a, another webinar to help us as a community stay engaged and to provide us with insights and expertise from industry experts. I think the one thing that was truly evident over the um, past month or so was the number of issues that emerged um, during this lockdown uh, in unprecedented times. And on the back of that, um, the Financial Services Council uh, commissioned core data to undertake some research. And yesterday, in partnership with the New Zealand Herald, that research was launched to the New Zealand market. Uh, under the guise of being called the Financial Resilience Index. So really this index is just um, a tracker of New Zealanders around five key indicators, um, very important indicators around financial preparedness, financial literacy, uh, job security, well-being, and financial confidence more importantly. Um, and it's interesting, you will hear from Richard and our panelists today how the mood of these New Zealanders changed during March and April. And I think the most important thing for me was that the index identified that financial resilience affects all age groups. And it really provides a stern reminder to everybody um, of the challenging outlooks that many Kiwis are now facing towards even, uh, for example, retirement planning. So it's very much my pleasure to introduce today two of our key research uh, colleagues, Andrew Inwood, who is the MD and founder of Core Data, and many of you will have met Andrew uh, during his um, time with us in February when he spoke at our Getting in Shape um, roadshows. And then we've also got uh, Furman Rianto, who is the Head of Operations at Core Data, and our very own Richard Clippen from the Financial Services Council. So the focus really today for all of us is to look at the key issues that were, have emanated from this research, to get a research lens across these issues, and, uh, and really more importantly, to understand, grasp, and take action on, and that's the important one, take action on, um, whether we are a... Um, member of the government, whether we are a regulator, whether we are a financial services provider, or whether we're an advisor, because um, we're all very aware that this was a health pandemic that um, hugely impacted everyone's lives in some way, shape or form, and in particular in the financial services sector. Now, importantly, also, this is your panel, so uh, your panel discussion, so please make sure that if you've got any questions, send them through to me, I'll manage them and, and ask the panel. But first up, I'd like to ask Richard if he could spend five or so minutes, perhaps on the research, Richard. So I guess we're all interested why the Financial Services Council decided to undertake this research. I'm sure there are some key highlights that came out, come out of that. And as I've said right at the start, kind of what happens next. So if I could hand over to you in the first instance. Thanks, Tricia, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, so just some context uh, within the FSC's um, uh, research uh, committee, we uh, for uh, the, the last three years have gone through the, what is it that we want to try and understand about the way New Zealanders think about money, consume financial services, uh, work with advice, and so on and so forth. And very much the theme of last year was around insurance and KiwiSaver. This year has been very much about how do New Zealanders consume financial services? How do they, how do they think about the role of these products and services in their lives? What role does it play? Is it just about money or is it much broader than that? Um, so we would actually um, started working with Core Data uh, late uh, December and decided to hit the go button uh, in late February. And in we were in market with a whole range of questions on that particular topic as COVID started to break. And in fact, this research sample for March was the 12th to the 20th of March. And then COVID broke. And what we figured out is that actually, whilst we've got some fantastic data here, we also have some, if you like, ground zero data about how New Zealand is thinking about right now. And, and so um, uh, with the core data team and the research team, we kind of sat down and reframed and said, actually, what are the key issues we ought to be investigating? Because none of us 
uh, have lived through a pandemic. And yet this is going to fundamentally change the way New Zealanders think about many things, obviously on a health level, uh, but certainly in the way that we think about money and the things that we do with money, the, the way we plan, the way we get advice and so on and so forth. And so we went back in field uh, into, into very late April. And the intent here is that we're going to track this every six weeks. Uh, and we will see as we go through, as we've gone through stage four, uh, into stage three, now into stage two, and then to one and hopefully beyond, uh, what New Zealanders are thinking. So these are the five indicators. Um, we wanted to understand financial confidence. How do people overall feel about money and, and what they did with it? We want to understand things around literacy, uh, things like, uh, which is pretty in evidence as the markets came off huge time, what would people do? Would they, would they cut and run? Would they hold their line? Would they add more investments? Were they actually prepared for the shock? Things like that. Um, financial preparedness was uh, indicated through was partly about that, but it was also partly about the notion of retirement. And of course, what often happens with these major shocks is that those people who may be two, three, five years out from retirement, it actually gets them to rethink that. Um, the big one and the big headline that those of you saw the Herald yesterday is around job security. A huge shift month on month on that. Uh, and Andrew will likely talk a bit further about that. And then key indicator five was all about well-being. And the well-being piece is probably the, the insight piece uh, for me at a personal level that's starting to come through because, um, you know, it is this notion of money is, uh, you know, money's a marker, money is choice, money is all these things. Money is what you, what y you do with it, but it's also um, what it allows you to do and how it makes you feel. And so this notion of well-being and mental health and physical health um, and uh, emotional security, knowing that you can weather a storm is one of the huge hits that's been taken, but certainly one of the things to watch. And we've been talking about this obviously within the FSC and more broadly in the sector uh, over the last couple of years particularly in the life insurance lens, but, but these are like really uh, critical pieces to, to, to take a lens on. So Tricia, I might leave it there. We're going to explore these things in a little bit more detail, but I'll, I'll hand to Andrew to give us a little bit more depth and a little bit more context, not only with the New Zealand situation, but uh, also more broadly um, um, around the globe. For those of you who haven't seen the slide deck, there's plenty more in that deck. Um, and you can just head to the FSC website to, to download that after this. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, thanks very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be talking to my uh, cousins in, uh, in New Zealand. And for me, of course, I mean that both metaphorically and physically. I've got a lot of relatives in New Zealand, given that I was born in Papakura. Um, one of the things, there's a couple of things to focus on really here as a kind of behavioural economist that I think are the most important. The first is job security. So that's a very good leading indicator of spending behavior and the way in which people are acting around, not just around investing, but also around spending. Then there's the concept of financial well-being. Cordata is, for those of you who don't know, a multinational. We collect this data in Australia, in the UK, and in the USA. Um, candidly, only in the eastern market of the USA, we don't really collect the data in the West. The USA, as you know, is four separate markets which all behave differently. And the one that we focus on is the West Coast. Um, sorry, the East Coast, the Northeast Coast. Um, so looking at the variation of what's going on, it's important to understand that the 25% of people in New Zealand who think they're going to lose their job is lower than both in the UK and the USA, where those numbers are significantly higher, up around the 40%, and the way in which that's working out is that that tends to be true. Um, but critically, it's three times more than normal. Normally, when we do this survey in Australia and New Zealand, there's about 8% of the market who think they've got some kind of job stress. So the number of people are losing their, or thinking that they're going to lose their job has tripled, which is going to have a long-term effect on, on the economy. And the way I want everyone to start to think about this is while we've negotiated the health effects, as Richard's mentioned, we're a long way from negotiating the economics, economic effects. For, in some ways, this is a bit like the spring of 1942 uh, when Winston Churchill was speaking. It's not the beginning of the end, but it's certainly the end of the beginning. Governments all around the world have chosen variously to either push their economy off a cliff in the service of health or not, and are prepared to accept the deaths. In Australia and New Zealand, we pushed our economies off a cliff. Whether we are Humpty Dumpty and collapsing at the bottom of the cliff or Jackie Chan is yet to be decided. Spending behaviour and confidence has, has certainly, certainly shown a V-shaped recovery in both economies. 
but how long that can be sustained without government intervention and how long that can continue without the economies proper providing for themselves, we don't yet know. And we won't really know until the third quarter of this year, until sometime in September. But the signs are there that this is going to be protracted and deep as unemployment, employment is the big driver of what's going on. So how we act on that is really important. The evidence for the role of financial planning and, and guidance in this time is writ large across the economies now. I don't have the data in New Zealand, but I do have the data in Australia. We work closely with the superannuation funds here, and one of which is one of the teachers' funds. And at the time when people could start to move their assets around inside the super fund, we saw a large number of teachers start to shift their funds out of the share market into cash where they were self-directed, and also a large number where they could simply pull their money out. Now that's really interesting, right? Because their jobs aren't at risk. They're teachers in government schools, so they're not going to lose their role. They were simply reacting to it. Now working with that superannuation fund as we, as we do, a negligible number of people who had um, financial advisors actually moved their money. It was the unadvised who ran to safety. So far that's cost them 25% as the market has rebounded very strongly. And the long-term effect of that is, is really going to be significant. So the effects of advice and the way in which advice works through that is going to be really important to, to the economies. I'd like to think that there's a way that we can start to communicate with people about making financial decisions, never ignoring the fact that about 40% of the economy is living from paycheck to paycheck. There is no advice that helps these people because they're simply living paycheck to paycheck. What's interesting to us and interesting to you is the people who are making active decisions with their money and how they make the best of that at a time like this. This isn't yet an economic crisis, it's a health crisis, but it will become an economic crisis as the money that comes out of the system isn't replaced. The challenges in both Australia and, and New Zealand is that the government, who in our case has tipped in about $400 billion to, to now and future costs to save the economy, and about 25% of the size in, the, in New Zealand, where that money is gonna come from, we're probably going to have to make some taxation reforms in Australia to fund that. And the same has got to be true of New Zealand. So how people negotiate that and the complexity of that is going to be foisted on, on the feet of the financial planners. Now, here's the thing we also know about people in New Zealand. They're very resilient. They've shown this through all sorts of cycles, through weather cycles and geographic cycles and, and industrial cycles. So th their ability to recover from this is kind of hardwired in their genes but it's not going to be easy and it's likely to be inflationary. And with that, I'll hand back to Richard. Okay, well, Andrew, so just leading on from that, um, people are worrying about money and that does put considerable strain on their well-being, whether it be their physical, their relationship well-being, their mental well-being. Um, so how alarming is this? Uh, because I hear what you're saying, but, you know, this worry does lead to another section of this index? So the worry is writ large. So the worry does two things. One is it constrains behaviour. It actually, it, it, it stops money moving through the system. And the economists know that that's a big driver, right? As money comes out of the system and starts to come out of the, what, what we count as M2, that means that all sorts of retail problems start to, to, to occur inside, inside um, the economy. So all the businesses that re rely on the amount of money circulating inside the economy start to dry up and dry up. And that in, in New Zealand is about 30 to 40 percent of the economy. So if you halve the amount of money through the, moving through the company, then that, that gets hurt really badly. So that doesn't just mean tourism, it does, just doesn't mean retail, and it doesn't mean um, travel, which are the big internal travel, which is a big drivers in the New Zealand economy, about 30 percent of it. But also it means things like education, it means things like home purchases, it means things like home renovation. It means all those big physical asset decisions start to become really significant. The other part of that which is concerning, and I don't have the data for New Zealand, but I have the data for the US, the UK and Australia, is that um, uh, domestic violence rises quite quickly at times like this as the stress moves through the, moves through the household and people don't really know how to react and cope with the stress. So they're quite concerning, both economically long-term and, and kind of physically as well. Trisha, there's a kind of interesting problem with this, and I'm not sure how to talk about it because, I mean, I'm a behavioural economist by, by training as much as you can be, but speaking as an economic rationalist, you get this kind of challenging idea about how this works and what the future looks like. 
we seem to be very good at solving problems of the old economically, but not solving problems of the young. What we've done in the last little while, both economically and, and logically, is twisted our economies to suit the old. The old are in danger of the virus, and the older are the ones who are in danger of losing their money. And we've done that relatively quickly. <clears throat> this problem, as you've pointed out, is multi-generational. It sits across all generations and their understanding the stress. But the old aren't going to have to experience it, partly because we're asset rich and our incomes are more secure, logically, and partly because um, we, we've got, we're, we're going to live through less of the ramifications of it. But we have pushed this down the pipeline relatively significantly. Trish, uh, there's also a, cu a couple of questions that have just come in, one, a couple in particular from David, which I think are worth pointing out. Oh. Um, and, and Fuman, you may provide some insight to the generational stuff. But um, when, we went to, when we went in field on the 12th of March, um, uh, we hadn't yet figured out the tiering system. You know, the, the fact of this being a global pandemic that was seriously going to impact New Zealand um, hadn't yet really hit the shores. So that ground zero data, whilst it's obviously got in, in, insight from the early days before COVID was the only uh, issue in town, um, is kind of interesting. So, uh, and, then, and then we kind of, um, uh, you know, for those of us uh, who kind of recall the, you know, the, that 10 days almost that changed the world, we went from uh, COVID's happening somewhere else to now here's our four tier system to now we're on two and then bang, within a couple of days, we were basically in lockdown, right? So the, the scale of the shift was just massive, uh, both in the way it was communicated and led politically and then kind of the way that we all responded. And I, I don't know about people on the phone, but it kind of felt like um, in some ways that um, six or seven weeks in lockdown um, was almost this, you know, bubble blessing place. Now, if you are really struggling uh, financially, then the job subsidy piece that came through obviously insulated. Um, we couldn't go out, we couldn't spend anything. And so some of the, this is again to the other part of the question, some of the data that feels like it's come through is reflective of, I think, two things. One is um, people's uh, P&L pretty much froze at that point in time, um, other than perhaps uh, regular outgoings, although um, the banks obviously worked fairly quickly to get uh, the mortgage uh, holiday um, or uh, uh, on hold uh, for a while. The other thing is the speed of the government leadership piece and the confidence that that led to the way people felt about their futures um, uh, is not a question that we ask, but it is one that we can ask into the next section because um, this notion of personal family business resilience in your bubble set against the context of what's happening uh, in the uh, in your country and how are your how are your leaders and health leaders and political leaders behaving um, in New Zealand seems like some of the data when you read it might give you a little bit of a mixed message on one hand people are really worried about job security on the other hand they feel a bit better on certain things so so one of the things that we've said is that actually we do want to track this through because um, all of those contextual pieces are shifting um, and at the point in time that we've taken the research data um, uh, was was as we were heading before lockdown and then we went into lockdown and then as we were coming out of lockdown. Um, the other thing, just to Andrew's point, you know, sitting behind this data are some really, really sad and tragic and difficult circumstances. Um, you know, I live on Wahiki Island. Um, uh, there's a, f a famous chef and his wife had just started um, and took a lease on this fabulous restaurant on the main street on Oniroa. Um, I don't know what commitments they made, um, but they came in to resurrect and rebuild a business. And bang, uh, within, you know, with all the planning, with all the spend, with all the money, um, they were basically shut down for a period of time with an unknown future. Um, so multiply that out into the homes, the hearts, the businesses, the families of New Zealand. Behind this data are some really real uh, issues. And, and again, it's pretty easy to take the headline data and go, there's a trend happening here. I think for all of us, particularly the sector that we operate in, um, it's, it's what sits behind these numbers. And there's a, there's a question we'll come to later in this discussion about, so what does it mean and how can we help and what could we possibly do about it? But uh, Fumin, I just wondered whether you had any insight on that, that uh, juxtaposition around generations. In terms of the generations, yeah, I mean, it's quite clear that the, um, 
issues and financial security and confidence affects all generations. Just a little bit to add to your, your talking about there about the timeframes of when the research was done. I guess it's, you can look at it from two perspectives. The first, the first perspective is asking, asking Kiwis whether or not COVID has affected their confidence and sentiment and job security and all that. And very clear the data suggests that yes, it has. And there's clear evidence of that across all the age generations and the wealth segments. But I think as to why some of the results might seem contradictory, it's probably because when the research is in field. So when we look at the first March piece, that was, that was started in 12th of March. That was, as you said, Richard, that was just the early days of the COVID case, COVID in New Zealand. But then as, as the government sort of intervened with its policies and all that, you see the, start, you see the curve start to flatline since mid-April. And when we came back to field again towards the back end of April, by that time, I think New Zealand moved from level four to level three already. And along with that is the increased confidence. And because of that, you'd see the improvement in some of the data that we're seeing now. So I think that's probably some of it as well. Um, yeah. So Furman, I was interested, what mm. surprised you with the research? What were some of the call outs that did surprise you? And perhaps then Andrew could follow. Yeah, I mean, when, we, when we're thinking about doing the April wave of the research, we were thinking that the results are going to fall off the cliff, right? Because when, we, when the March one was in field, it was still very much early days. We weren't quite sure what's going to happen in April. Um, so when we decided to go back again in April, we expected results to be fully fall off the cliff. So con job security to be falling rapidly, confidence to be falling rapidly. But that hasn't quite proven to be the case. Yes, people are saying that COVID has affected their sense of security and confidence. But if you look at the results, when you compare the two points in time, in early March, yes, it's, a, it's an issue. But in April, things have actually improved. So I think it comes down to the two points in time. So, however, I think that reflects uh, this, the view that Kiwis are resilient, quite a, um, as Andrew suggested earlier. So Kiwis have been a lot of, Kiwis have been through a lot of trouble in the past, um, but they've pulled, pulled through and this will be no difference. Well, it's a bit more challenging than that to pick up on Trish's point and I also think of Furman's point. The, the New Zealanders have been cushioned from the true blow of this in the way which no other country has, or Australia has, by the way in which the government has acted. Um, the, the problems are yet to the point that I was making earlier are yet to come. This is not the beginning of the end, but it's the end of the beginning. It's certainly the end of the, the, um, the health crisis. I imagine it's the end of the health crisis. I'm no epidemiologist and I don't want to speak out of line. But the economic challenge is to come. How this is funded is going to be really interesting. New Zealand isn't able to magic putting its economy in a way which some other economies are, right debt to itself, unfund its whole, uh, whole process because of, and I say this as someone who, who really loves New Zealand and feels that it's part of my heritage, because of the relative fragility of the economy, it lacks the depth of resources to fund its own way out of this, either through government borrowings or through, or, or through changing taxation systems. I mean, if you look at the ways that this has happened around the world in the past, particularly um, post-Second World War or, or post the, the, the first JFC in Japan, the governments have had to run inflationary policies to, to, to drive these things out. Either, you know, the Weimar Republic famously did it by massively inflating really quickly and turning their debt into custard. The, the New Zealand government lacks the ability to do that. It can't write debt to itself and issue a series of bonds like the Japanese or the Germans or the French can. It doesn't have the bazooka of firepower like the Fed does this, to spend limitlessly. You can't have, I've forgotten the name of the German tr chancellor, the treasurer, but he simply got up and said out, Martin, I've forgotten his last name, we're abandoning black zero and we have a bazooka of capacity to spend our way through this system. We simply, as Pacific Rim nations, don't have that firepower. How we cope with it is going to be really interesting. But real pain is yet to come for whole segments of the society. And it's not just if you work in retail, it's not just if you work in tourism or education or those other areas which rely fundamentally on the money coming from outside to, to, to make it happen. As that money comes out of the economy, the pain is shifted through it. Now, let's be really clear. The pain is going to be asynchronous. Some groups are going to do incredibly well out of this. The very old who are on defined pensions are going to do very well out of this because there's likely to be falling asset values and rising of the real incomes. The people who uh, have got strong permanent incomes are going to do very well out of this and they're going to be able to take advantage of it. But people whose incomes are locked into the economy are going to struggle as they move through this process. 
And it's the job of the, the country to try and smooth that out. That's what good governments do. do. But their firepower is not limitless. And that, that's important to consider. And Trish, Trisha, we've already started to see that happening. You know, yesterday there was a decision around, um, around stuff uh, to sell to its CEO effectively in an MBO, um, you know, because two months ago, in terms of the media sector, uh, we had Bauer pull out of New Zealand and effectively overnight made the call. Um, so, so it feels to me that at a, at, a, at a commercial level, at a business level, sectors will need to, and this is picking up uh, Andrew, a uh, resilience point, are going to have to be smart about how they think about what it is that they do um, in the same way that in lockdown, you know, cafes and restaurants said, well, we'll do a drive-through service as an example, a small one. But, you know, we're, we're facing into uh, the tourism sector that isn't going to have uh, an international traveller come through for some time. Maybe the Aussie uh, trans-Tasman bubble, Pacific bubble might open up uh, through August, September, and and be a fillip for this for the back end of the ski season, but 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 what if it's not? Um, and so you know, businesses will in in the end have to make decisions about how they manage their you know what's left of their business, or in a sense, repurpose their cap their capacity and their capability. Um, and and I think again, you know, if I bring this back to the resilience uh, conversation, you know, that's part of the resilience piece: the ability to actually do that, the ability to have the cash flow to be able to do that, as well as the creativity to go, if I've got this core skill set, how will I make it happen? Um, and so I think, yeah, Andrew's mention of a two or three or a four stage uh, kind of recovery or sections of the economy that will respond differently, but in the end with a shrinking base, uh, and it's a, it'll depend on whether, you know, how far off the cliff quarter two and quarter three become as to whether we're going to bounce back or we go to, to the W shape will be in the response to how does government manage its spend? How does business get its shape together? Um, and then there's that kind of whole internationalization because of how, how leveraged uh, New Zealand is to what happens in the rest of the world. So um, uh, I think, I think tracking the resilience index, whilst it's not designed to pick it up at a national level, business-wise, certainly at a family level, individual level, it would be interesting to see, and I expect we'll start to see some of that flow through in the next couple of iterations. Cool. Um, I'm really keen to get on to the topic of financial advice, one of my little, um, I guess, dear to my heart. Um, and um, we've talked lots of times on web these different webinars about the value of advice. And Andrew, we talked a little bit before about, you know, what is the alpha that's added on, on through advice or whatever. But I, I guess it's, um, you know, what are the big themes out there around advice? And, and, you know, I'm interested in Australia also, you know, what's how's, how have the advice community contributed um, towards, you know, uh, dealing with it, dealing, dealing as a community, dealing with this crisis? So uh, I imagine it's very <laughs> like New Zealand. The need for information has risen through the roof. And what we've seen is the very good businesses start to communicate a lot more frequently and exploit a lot of channels. So what happens when people face uncertainty is that what they're looking for is communication information. And I've talked before about the way various groups, behavioural groups take in information, but the frequency of the communication is something which is really important. The great groups have been communicating weekly with weekly updates of what's going on and what's happening and what people can do. People are desperate because we're humans and we're looking for patterns in everything we do. That's part of what makes us human to look for data about how they should be behaving and they're looking for data about how their advisor is, is acting and what they're talking about at the moment. So the type of communication that needs to go out must be very much in, instead of opportunity about security and about leadership and making sure that people are getting those pieces of information. The second thing that, that has to be really important is the clear demonstration from the advice network that while this is the first time we've faced, faced the pandemic, we understand how to deal with this and we understand that what we should be doing and how people should be reacting to it. Um, there is a desire, or there certainly was a desire in Australia for op opportunism. Uh, you may or may not have read the ASIC re re report. As soon as Australians were sent home to do nothing, 147,000 new day trading accounts were opened up and more than 90% of people who opened those lost money on them. That's pretty interesting, right? So they gambled with their own money. It turns out, being a financial advisor and doing it yourself turns out to be really hard. And if you want any more evidence about the value of advice or the way people should be making decisions, that's 
that was a real time example of stupidity and, and money um, working. Maybe it's because they shut the pokies down in Sydney, I don't know, and they thought they were going to gamble in some other way. Um, but the, the reality is people found out that it's complicated and that navigating their way through the crisis is really important. Now, here's something that's really interesting about the way that humans make decisions. So for a long time, I used to race on an ocean yacht and I was a four deck hand or a mast hand before becoming a sail trimmer. And the guy who ran the yacht was a very famous psychologist and he made it really clear that when he was racing, he didn't want advice from us about what to do. He wanted information. And then if he wanted advice, he would reach out to us. So as this moves through its complexity, the big piece of need that the people have is a good solid stream of information coming through their advisor about what's happening in the market and what they're doing about it. And making sure that information gets to them regularly. And then the other next part that's really important is people need to be doing something. People feel they should be reacting in some way. So allowing micro decisions to be made is also a really important part of what's going on. It, I mean, Richard hates it when I do this, but there's a very powerful piece of viewing in psychology which says, don't make big decisions under stress, shorten your time frames. I don't want to talk about the three year view. I want to talk about the one month view and make micro decisions on what you're doing. I'm not putting any more money into stocks. I'm putting more money into stocks. I'm doing something, but making sure that that something is logical and thought through. I think that 99.9% .9 of advisors and certainly all the ones on this call will know what to do. But to allow them to make micro decisions is, is really important. I mean, I, I obviously talk to people all around the world on, on a daily basis. I was up at 6 a.m. this morning talking to my, my friends and cohort in Boston. And one of the fund managers in Boston, he's an Australian, so he can say this. He said, the joke in Boston is at the moment is what's the loudest sound in the world? An Australian or a New Zealand Zealander patting themselves on the back. Yeah, great. Thanks, Richard. But his name is Richard as well, not that Richard. Um, so we've got to be aware that we're at, we are in a different spot. And there was, as he pointed out yesterday, there was 870 new people diagnosed in Boston yesterday. And we, we you know, that, that's more people in one day than we're kind of facing in New Zealand at, at all. So understanding that is really important. But then you've got to understand that that's one of the big engines of liquidity in the world. The money coming out of the northeast of, New, of America drives the world economy because about 80% of the world's fund managers are there, which is why I'm up at five in the morning talking to them. But understanding that means that, you know, that money trickles down to everything that we do. So the money is coming out of the system really fast. It's getting stuck in the system and all the works have been gummed up and how quickly it returns to the system, I don't know. No one knows. So we've moved through a, 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 um, a system of understanding in our business and we're doing it around the world. I don't think we're different to anyone else. The first thing that we've been focusing on is a project of resilience. That finishes this week. Then the second project is rebuild. How do we rebuild ourselves to match the new time? And then we're being really aware, we're running a team that is looking for the first indicator that things are becoming ungummed, if you like, and that'll be reboot. So resilience project is done. We, we know what we need to do and how we're doing it. And like everyone else around the world, that's about, about becoming an excellent cash manager. So every business in the world now is becoming an excellent cash manager, making sure that they're spending every cent wisely, which means all frippery is gone. Then rebuilding it to match the new, new normal, which means that we've got to put all our resources on making sure that we're satisfying our new client needs. And all the financial advisors understand that now, right? So, Everyone has new needs. And then the next thing is making sure that we're aware of the reboot phase and making sure that you don't miss it when it runs. So that's really everyone's doing that. Trisha, just a, a couple of points, just grabbing hold of uh, Andrew's uh, comments. So the piece around uh, communicating and, uh, and providing information that's out there. You know, one of the things that's happened in, in New Zealand over the last uh, three months, you know, is the thirst is absolutely there. Um, and you can see as people have uh, done whatever, put out media, uh, created little videos, whatever they've done um, has, been, has been hugely um, uh, taken up. Um, and, and so what we're starting to tap into within the FSC piece is um, the media is still looking for great stories on this. Um, and you can see uh, brands and advisors kind of stepping into that gap as well to continue that conversation. And so I think... I think I, to, to Andrew's point, we're not out of this yet. We're into a new different and different phase. Uh, and I think one of the things the resilience index points to is communicate more, get on the front foot more, get information out there, keep that connection going 
The, the other piece, and this is a signal to the longer version of the research, uh, which you'll hear more about uh, probably in the next three to four weeks, uh, titled, um, it's uh, money and you. It's not about money, it's about you. And there's a, there's a huge amount of depth of insight there around the role of advisors, because part of this research that, that we've gone into is to understand what advised clients did think and feel uh, and those that don't have advice. And what's been really interesting, and again, to the KiwiSaver managers on the phone, you know, will have known that your call centers went up thousands of percent, you know, maybe from an average call rate, uh, multiplied, multiplied, multiplied in that white hot at the back end of March. Um, there are a whole bunch of people who were calling call centers or making decisions about investing more. Um, so we're going to be able to tease into that. And what's become really important, um, and sadly, for those who haven't had their guide, coach and advisor on the way into this pandemic is that on the way out, people that do have the coach, guide and advisor are in a much stronger and much more resilient position, not just in a financial sense, and we'll go on in the next bit of research to evidence what that actually is in a quantifiable sense for the New Zealand marketplace, but, but in the non-financial stuff. And so when you think about, when we're thinking about money, and again, to an audience of people who know about money, we kind of do know that it isn't about money. It's all about the things that it does and it makes us feel and so forth. And that is very clear in the evidence. It's very clear in the, the conversations. There were a bunch of free open questions that we asked people and the data that's coming back from that's going to be pretty interesting to share. Uh, but I do think, I, uh, I do think, and finally to Andrew's uh, earlier point, um, it, you know, in some ways it feels uh, as New Zealanders, uh, uh, you know, that, that we vanquished the enemy, that the bad COVID enemy is dead and buried. And actually, um, this is going to be a long way from finished. And so I think all of us in whatever role we play in the sector have a pretty important responsibility to help whichever our client bases are to navigate through whatever comes next, because uh, we clearly don't know what's coming next and just witness the Prime Minister standing in the beehive yesterday and the earth, the, you know, the walls start to shake, you know, like seriously. Um, so, so whatever other earthquakes may be coming our way or, or issues, I think we've got to be resilient as a, as a sector to how we help New Zealanders um, ultimately get through this. And in the end, as an essential service, the financial services sector is essential. We are going to be essential in the recovery, uh, providing the advice to businesses and families for sure but also some of the bigger structural stuff, given that at the sector level, KiwiSaver is that 50 to 60 odd billion dollars. Um, you would have seen there's a conversation restart about uh, access and the universality of, uh, of, uh, of access to Kiwi, um, uh, the pension fund payments. So there's all those kind of things in play. And I think we've just got to be in our game as we head into, into the next uh, weeks and months ahead. And Richard, you um, did bring out some good points there that whilst the um, FRI might have a bit of gloomy uh, gloom hanging across it, there were actually some good pointers and good takeouts to take from it. So Furman, just on that, and I know Conscious have only got five minutes, so I do want everyone to have their final say. Um, talking about investing, what does investing look like in the future then, Furman, if you look at the um, index? What, 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 what's your take out from that? Yeah, I mean, there's some clues that um, some clues are, cha are changing or looking to change the way they invest. So as a result of COVID, I think one in four are now looking for lower risk investments. Uh, and there's some, some data that suggests that that's happening. So we, while we don't have a lot of data, but we do have some clues. So for example, in the April data, we found that 55% um, have cash investments compared to 50% in the March data. Uh, so yeah, so they are looking to, to invest in low risk investments. Um, may not be the best idea because they could have crystallized losses and could be worse off in the future. Because uh, obviously the investment might not grow as quickly as they would had they not crystallised the losses, but that's that's one potential change. I guess just touching on a bit of good news there, we have we do see in the April data that there's some improvement in the understanding of investment concepts. Uh, why I think that is is perhaps as a result of this financial crisis and all that, Kiwis may have been forced to be more engaged with their finances and maybe spend a bit more time to learn about investments, how their money is invested, and all that. And that's why we are seeing evidence of improved understanding of certain concepts in, in some areas, although there is still some way to go. Uh, in some areas, it is still low. Um, so that's a little bit about what I think would be interesting to track going forward. Yeah, and, and we have spent yeah. a lot of time on financial literacy, which is, again, another thing dear to my yeah. heart. 
and that's a whole webinar in its own right. Yeah. So I'm conscious now we've got about four minutes left. So I just like starting with Andrew, really just um, a o- quick overview, Andrew, of where we're sitting now at the index as it's looking. I know we're going to you know, continue uh, working through it, but just some final comments from you and then I'll hand to you, Furman, and, and yeah. then Rich finish. But, so the economic outcome is pretty clear and we can map the amount of money coming out of the economy. What's really important now is that we form a long-term view which is driven both by the government and the behaviour of the population. New Zealand's facing an election relatively soon. Um, um, it's shown itself to be incredibly good at crises. Um, I think as a nation, you're probably sick and tired of, of being incredibly good at crises. That's something which is quite painful. But, I mean... Uh, I think that is extraordinary. But how you move from being good at crises, from being economic development is a big challenge. And the skills that you require for that are relatively extraordinary. How to create the free cash flow, how to create the type of environment which encourages that, and how to do that without issuing new taxes on the population which will constrict cash flow is going to be really important. There's some kind of obvious under-taxed areas in the, the New Zealand economy, and, and we all know what they are and where they exist. Um, they would be unpalatable um, for a government to enter into. I mean, new taxes is not a way to run an election campaign. If you want to look at recent history and that, there's a guy called John Houston who tried that in Australia and went from an unlosable election to finding himself unemployed inside six weeks. But making sure that you can actually deliver an environment where growth is possible is really um, is the next big challenge. And I'm sorry, I've talked too long. So let me hand over hand back to you, Trish. Oh, thank you, Furman. Oh, I have to be very quick here. Just want to add a little bit about, I guess, the money worries and well-being. We talk about, um, I think it's a self-perpetuating cycle, right? Money worries affect health and well-being, which then affect earning capacity, and then you start the cycle again. So really, there's, there's a clear link between financial stress and um, money worries, particularly mental health. Uh, and as we discussed before, this affects all age groups, but also all wealth and income segments. Just because you're well-off doesn't mean that um, you are mentally well. So not all of those who are well-off are mentally well. And conversely, not all those who are disadvantaged feeling depressed or anxious uh, because the way we view our financial situation is what impacts our mental health. The type of money worries differ. So for the lower end, maybe it's about how do I make my next mortgage repayment? But for the higher end, maybe it's about do I have the right insurance or the right investments? So I think um, going forward, I think that's something else that we can't afford to ignore. It's the mental health side of things. Thank you, Richard. Any comments? Yeah, and just two points in closing. So to, to Furman's point, we're already starting to see within the life insurance community within the FSC early signs of the mental health uh, issues um, coming through the sector. Um, um, and so things like income protection, um, uh, I heard last week first death claim for suicide as a, result, as a result of COVID. So the very real human costs underpinning this data uh, we're going to start to see a whole lot more of. Um, so, so I think that's the first thing. Second thing, in terms of where we take the, uh, the resilience index, um, we landed in a place where we had some good data and we thought we should just go on with this. What's going to be interesting to do is to now track this through um, and, and then start to think about how do we as a sector actually collectively help? Because like I say, if, if there was one sector in the New Zealand economy that actually can help people make tangible decisions to get out of uh, the deep place where we're going to be. Um, it's going to be people who are sitting and working alongside businesses and families, helping people make, people make the right priority decisions, investing decisions, soundboard decisions, access to quality information and so forth. So I think, I think in that regard, this overall notion of why is it that only one in five New Zealanders get advice? Um, that's a conversation for another time, but I think we're pretty well placed to be part of the solution as we come out of this in conjunction with, uh, obviously, with government policy, regulators and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we look forward to sharing this with uh, the broader the New Zealand community and certainly the FSC family. So um, thanks, Trish. Thanks, Richard. And look, Andrew, um, I do like the three R's. So I like the resilience. Um, I like the rebuild. 
and I particularly like the reboot. So uh, that gives me some great heart when I hear those three words. And I'm one of those Cantabrians that has been through a fair bit of stuff and one of those New Zealanders. So look, thank you to the three of you for your insights and your guidance. Um, we look forward to the continued tracking of this and, and uh, be getting together again and having another look at where um, the data stands. So for everyone else that's participated and listened, thank you very much. An evaluation form is coming through now. So please take uh, the opportunity to fill that out and enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you to our Australians. Um, goodbye. Thank you.